This gives me the perfect opportunity to tell you that all of our lectures are being taped. So if you've missed one, if you've missed one of the first two or you can't come to the last uh, two, uh, please go to the library website and you'll be able to see them. I, it's, if you didn't see Dr. Julian's two lectures, they were both uh, really uh, very good and I would encourage everybody uh, to look at those. I'm going to give you a couple of highlights starting out. I'm going to just give you a really quick synopsis of what hap is happening now with climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the history of sustainability in Benicia. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about climate change. That was the subject of Dr. Julian's last lecture. Uh, but I, she did a visual demonstration that I thought was very powerful. And I'm going to recreate that one tonight. So this is our globe. This is our Earth. This fr fruit roll-up. represents how big, how deep our atmosphere is. So you can see when we're talking about pouring tons and tons and tons of CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere, we don't have a whole lot there really in the scheme of things. Um, that's why one reason why it's so important that we start taking action now. Uh, climate change science has identified many of the things that are going to start happening with climate change. These things are starting to happen right now. We're already experiencing higher temperatures. Um, we're already experiencing droughts. Every time you open up the newspaper, it seems like you're reading about one disaster after another that's weather related. Last summer, there were huge fires and droughts in uh, Russia. They lost the equivalent of uh, wheat that would have covered the state of Kansas that had worldwide implications on the food supply. A couple of uh, not a few years ago in Europe, there was a massive heat wave that killed 50,000 people. Um, we in California are facing the loss of our Sierra snowpack, which essentially is our water reserve. That can be very serious for us. Right now, not only are we anticipating a 55-inch sea level rise, but planning organizations are starting to say, we have to start planning for that because we don't see the CO2 emissions coming down. We're starting to see the spread of tropical diseases uh, in fact, uh, the definition of the tropics, it's actually moved up and down two latitudes, two degrees in latitude in both north, north and south. And we're seeing tropical diseases now in places that we've never seen them before. Um, scientists are predicting there could be up to a 50% loss of all species on Earth within the next 50 years. We're seeing more and more severe weather events. I, start, I started to keep clippings of them. <laughs> this is one that I just happened to find from last summer. Deadly floods roar through the, uh, deadly floods roar through the Riviera. Uh, the kind of weather that we're seeing is much more severe. So instead of seeing showers, we're seeing deluges that are creating landslides and floods. We can just look at the Mississippi now and the tornadoes that happened in the southeast. These are things that are happening now all over the world. Look at Australia. They've been hit by a combination of all these events. So it's not necessarily things that we're talking about now that are going to happen in the future. We're starting to experience these things right now. I am looking at a great graph here <laughs> <laughs> that, shows, that shows from 1880 to 2000 the average temperature of the land and the ocean. And it looks like this. Dr. Julian had a, a slide at her last lecture that I thought was one of the most effective ones that I've ever seen. So follow me along. It goes like this. This is of sustainability is throughout this plan, which is a guiding document in Benicia. This went into effect in uh, 1999. Shortly after that, a group of local citizens uh, formed a watchdog association that was focusing on clean air. Uh, this was the Good Neighbor Steering Committee. 
they educated themselves, and I think this is one of the most remarkable things because when I first met Marilyn Bardet, I assumed she probably had a master's degree in city planning or some type of environmental law because she knew so much. And when I got to know her and talk to her, I realized she learned all this as she became more and more active in this area. Um, they became involved in air quality issues uh, regarding the refinery. Uh, Marilyn Bardet is one of the founding members, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the Good Neighbor Steering Committee and sort of tell us what happened next. I'm going to try to make this short. I've never had 15 minutes allotted me for speaking publicly. Um, maybe the last time I did that was at a council meeting about the Domes campaign. I don't know if you all remember that. That goes back to 1995, but it's true. Kathy Carriage is correct. I've, l I've had to learn everything that I know now about my city by getting involved in things that seemed of concern at the time where I had to drop something and get informed in order to speak um, publicly and intelligibly and clearly and help involve the public. So um, to start where Kathy left off, in 1999, after the general plan was adopted, there was a group of us who heard that the refinery was for sale. And ExxonMobil was forced to sell its refinery um, by, um, I guess, decree of the Attorney General of California. So we knew it was going to be uh, put into effect. We didn't have a way to challenge that. But we were very worried, not because Exxon was such a marvelous um, um, uh, corporate entity in town in terms of their environmental um, performance. However, they did have a very strong safety culture. So one of the first things we realized was how important it was to ensure that if the refinery was transferred to new ownership, we would be able to ensure a safety culture because that's our first line of defense for our own community. And then we could also worry about environmental quality because who would be the next? We called them suitor here. We, we were finding out that there were several refinery. Uh, Tesoro was one of the um, um, bidding for the uh, sale. Diamond Shamrock and um, Valero, and we didn't know anything about any of them except Tesoro, and we didn't like their uh, corporate record on, on the environment. So we got involved and wrote letters to those suitors and let them know that those of us who had chosen to get involved, and at that time it was six women, uh, including our mayor at that time, Elizabeth Patterson, Kitty Griffin, Mary Worley, um, Jan Cox Golovich, who had been on council, and myself, and later Dana Dean joined us, but at that point she was not uh, with us when we first started. Um, we actually um, insisted that people who were considering coming to Benicia would know that we were waiting for them and we would have questions. So um, we, we were um, uh, very intent on meeting with Valero right from the get-go and saying to them, and we were honored because Bill Grehe, the um, CEO of Valero from San Antonio, came to Benicia to sort of, you know, present the new ownership and management. And we met with Bill Grehe, um, all six of us, and we um, let him know that we were interested in protecting worker, the workers um, from Exxon, that they would maintain their jobs here if that's what they wanted. Um, we also were concerned about environmental quality issues to do with air quality because that was a concern uh, of the public. And we also um, uh, wanted to ensure that the safety culture at the refinery would be maintained. So um, in what we did learn, though, is that Valero is a much more approachable uh, corporate um, uh, company. Uh, the, their management style was much different, more pared down. They were much more accessible than Exxon. And this made it possible to have at least um, good rapport back and forth. That is, we could communicate with them. That was very different than when Exxon was here, although we weren't involved then. I wasn't with Exxon. So this was new for me, too. Um, in 2003, um, uh, what happened was Valero, uh, because they do not have oil fields of their own, knew they were out on the market to buy um, uh, more sour crudes because that's what's available out there now. When we're talking about energy, and I know you're reading the headlines, and you know that um, uh, it's getting harder and harder to find oil and the kind of oil that's now available. 
is dirtier crude. When I say dirtier, it means that there is a higher sulfur content in the crude oil and it's corrosive. And just to give you an example, one third of America's import oil imports are coming from the tar sands in Alberta. And that isn't even oil, that's bitumen. And they, it's an enormously energy intensive project for every one unit of um, product out um, of this, what they produce that oil. It takes two units of energy to get it out, including natural gas, a lot of hot water. It's, and it's hugely environmentally destructive. So, Valero uh, buying o on the open market has to uh, consider, um, had to consider how it could um, tune this refinery to meet the standards that would be upon them when they would produce more sulfur in the air um, because of the kind of crudes they were going to be processing. Not that they hadn't already been processing those crudes, but they were going to have to have more of them and many more types of them. So that is um, essentially. Uh, engaged us very much and because they were going to have to uh, make changes to the refinery, significant changes that were due too, because the refinery was built in 1968 to refine um, uh, Bay crude, which was a sweet crude, and now we were getting this other kind of, um, you know, they could look ahead. They were looking ahead and they saw that this is what was on the market. So we got fixated on air emissions quite, uh, we were really clearly involved with the concern for how to protect our own air for local air quality, let alone what it would do to the Bay Area Air Basin. To have six Bay Area refineries, I had to assume other refineries were going to be processing the same kind of crudes too. So I knew this was a regional issue, but I stayed focused with Good Neighbor Steering Committee on the local uh, impacts of what we called um, the, ex the expansion of the refinery, which was the, what they called the Valero Improvement Project. And they're right. It wasn't so much they expanded the capacity of the refinery, but they did um, uh, certainly have to do many, many upgrades. But the questionable upgrade was, are they going to put a scrubber on the main stack? Would they be required to put a scrubber on the main stack? This has not been done anywhere in the United States. There are no scrubbers uh, at that time in 2003. Nobody in the southeast, all those refineries in Texas and er everywhere, no, they don't have scrubbers on the main stack. And there was no other refinery in California with a scrubber on the main stack. But we were saying uh, they had suggested they could put a scrubber on the main stack. And it turned out, if you go out there today, if you drive by on East 2nd and you look out, you will see a big new green unit in the back. That is a scrubber. And what it is, is it takes all the gases that are coming out of the processing plant and putting them up through a new stack. It's not that tall cement thing. You'll not see anything more coming out of that tall uh, cement stack. It's that little stack in the back. It's kind of fat and green. And it's only putting out water vapor now. And it's, uh, it's, qu it's been quite effective, that, that scrubber they have found in the last, since their last turnaround in, in January. It, it has turned out that they are really, really surprised at how much reduction they're getting in SOX and NOx, uh, sulfur and um, nitrogen oxide emissions. So it's really doing the job. But back in 2003, it was questionable whether we were going to get one. We said, as the Good Neighbor Steering Committee, just a bunch of, you know, local activists saying, we want that scrubber, we insist on it. And what happened was um, um, this was, a, it was arduous to read the environmental impact report on the 2000 three expansion, the VIP um, expansion project. The thing is this thick. We read it carefully, all of us who were involved and many other, there were, I would say, maybe 20 people who commented very seriously. And um, Valero took it seriously. Um, the city did too. And um, everybody concerned about this um, um, weighed in with the planning commission and the Good Neighbor Steering Committee had to um, really uh, address the planning commission. We hired an attorney for $6,000. We had to scrape that money together and Dana Dean and Jan Cox Golovich really paid it off um, together. Um, we all contributed something but um, it, when you talk about the cost to um, local people to do the kinds of things that need to be done, it is a significant cost and, and personal investment over time is how we see it. But so we had delivered a message to the planning commission and the planning commission um, then recommended to council that the VIP project be approved but with certain conditions and the city um, went ahead with the approval of the certified document but we meanwhile had appealed the Planning Commission decision. So what happened in the end was that the city 
um, negotiated with Valero what they called the Good Neighbor Steering Committee at the time and got um, certain concessions and certainly we got the scrubber, which is huge, um, a huge victory for our whole city and for our community. I can't tell you, and I, now I'm a, um, a chair of the Valero um, Community Advisory Panel, which Good Neighbor Steering Committee also helped to form uh, at about that time, um, and uh, to provide access of the, uh, to provide a liaison w with the community, with community members and business community people to hear from Valero what they have to say about their um, their process and their operation. And so we've, ha we've maintained a dialogue with Valero over a very long time now, since 19, well, 2000 when they really formally came to town. Um, as you might, oh, there's nothing up there, so you can't see whether I'm really following this or not. <laughs> but, um, and that's to my advantage. Um, um, I know. Yes, you do, Constance, but I'm going to get there. So um, uh, just one more thing is that um, in 2003, in order to make, uh, to be effective in talking to our planning commission and to our city council, we formed an alliance with others, the Sierra Club and citizens from Vallejo, or, um, um, some people who, who have ended up on their city council and also later fought the LNG um, project for Mare Island. I don't know if you know, remember that. I was involved with that too. Um, it's been remarkable what we've been able to do with um, not, we don't need, you know, hundreds of people, but if you have 25 people who make a case, you can make your case. And I think um, it's proven to me over time that it really does matter when people get involved and, 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 and endure somehow sustain their own um, energy to be able to um, um, uh, address things of this magnitude, quite frankly. Um, and I would never have believed in a million years as an artist that I would ever be addressing a refinery, I can tell you that. Um, uh, what happened was we got, um, when the Good Neighbor Steering Committee went to the Planning Commission, before the city council finally approved, we asked for the main stack flue gas, flue gas scrubber, which I've talked about. We asked for neighborhood air monitoring stations. That was very ambitious. An asthma awareness program for the schools, tree planting initiatives, water reclamation and reuse project. And this got to be very interesting because what happened was um, they uh, had thought, and the city had thought, and recommended a project which would take uh, water from the, our wastewater treatment plant and retreat it to send it up to the refinery because at the time the scrubber that they were talking about building was going to use um, almost twice the amount of water. I think it was twice. I could be wrong on that, but um, it was an, an inordinate amount of water extra of what they already use. And I, I wonder how many of you know how much raw water ex, uh, Valero uses on a, any given day. Does anybody know? They use as much as the entire town every day. So when you're talking about water supply, the city has to be able to say how much water it has in its uh, agreements and things and contracts. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to do with what, how much water is coming to the Sierras as snowpack or how much rain we get, et cetera. So we could have paper water that looks like a great supply, but it really does depend on the weather, doesn't it? Um, but so this project looked pretty good um, to reclaim water from the sewage treatment plant and send it up to Valero to use for their scrubber. Well, that project was estimated at $15 million at that time. And a, um, a committee was formed called PURE, which Elizabeth uh, was uh, part of at that time. Uh, you were on council or were you mayor at this time? This was just gotten elected. So Elizabeth was on uh, the Pure Committee and others, and they took it very seriously. It spent a year, and it cost a million dollars to make a plan for that project. But what happened was the project uh, was estimated at $15 million. Um, A year later, you know how long it takes to do these things, um, the, uh, an auditor and accountant for Valero estimated that the costs now were going to be $46 million to build the exact same plant because why? And this has to do with sustainability, energy, and everything else. Um, costs of construction were going up between 2006 and 2009 between um, uh, six and nine percent, six and twelve percent. So you can see our cement was going to China, our steel was going to China. So Valero shelved the project. The city agreed that it wasn't uh, feasible, uh, but that 15 million remained out there as um, all of us thought of it, and Elizabeth certainly thought of it. 
that this was money that had been thought of as for environmental benefits for the community. Habitat replacement, we also asked for habitat replacement for potential or actual losses in aquatic locations, solar panels for BUSD, solar panels for the city of Benicia. Um, in the end, the city uh, uh, did its own um, good neighbor agreement at that time, and it did um, allow us to purchase uh, or to site, um, uh, find a location for an air monitoring, a permanent air monitoring station up above Tennis Drive on um, Valero's buffer zone property. And we, it gave us just enough money to do the siding, get the electricity there, and buy one piece of equipment from Argo Scientific called a UV Hound. And it essentially is like a, um, it reads gases, signature gases. It can read the chemistry of a gas as it passes through um, an ultraviolet light beam. And um, so we were thrilled, and that was worth about 45000 Oh, 45000 at that time to me sounded like a million dollars. I was just so thrilled. We were all just celebrating. And um, it was a promise that we also could ask for things and get something. You know? And for a long time in Benicia, I think we thought that we shouldn't ask for things because we're so lucky to have what we do have. And some of us referred to it as crumbs under the table. But that isn't very fair because times change and conditions in the city change. And now we're at a place where we think we can ask, and that's a good thing, of corporate um, responsibility um, to our community when things of this great concern. And we host the refinery. We get a huge benefit from them in terms of our revenue and tax base, but we also put up with the kinds of um, um, environmental concerns that we're addressing right now. So um, later, in 2005, the uh, Valero decided, based on um, its own assessment of its project and how things were changing and new technology, they revised, they wanted to revise their project. And actually, they called for a number of very signif significant improvements, and it was meaningful. So um, we understood that, but we, they produced an addendum which was not a sufficient review of their, uh, uh, what they were proposing. And we knew we could go to court with that. But we knew also that we weren't trying to stop this project because actually the benefits of what they were going to do were clear. But their analysis was faulty on, on global warming and water supply. And I wrote the letter, and Dana Dean at that time was representing Good Neighbor as a land use attorney. She had earned a law degree in all of this time since 1999, and she was absolutely um, 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 uh, intrinsic to our success. Um, and. So we challenged the addendum, and Valero basically said um, they understood we could go to court, basically, and they said, what do you want? Let's sit down and settle. So we were extraordinarily excited to, um, in a way, be honored to be in this position, because it is quite something. If, you're, if you were me, you'd understand. <laughs> um, anyway, so we settled for $14 million. And that's the 14 that was left on the table after they'd spent $1 million debating that other project, the water reclamation project. And here's something that the community doesn't generally understand. Um, we can't just take that money and use it for something else, the general fund or whatever. It's specifically tied to the problems we saw in the environmental impact report. It was tied to unmitigatable um, assess, uh, um, impacts that we saw on cumulative air impacts, on uh, that had to do with global warming and how much CO2, their evaluations of CO2 into the air, and then also about uh, water supply, the claims that were being made. Mind you, the city also hired an attorney and also hired an environmental consultant to identify problems with the addendum. They did not find them. The city, in a sense, I feel, missed its opportunity to discover those problems. So good thing, the Good Neighbor Steering Committee went through and um, did its job, and Valero agreed. So. The good news is we had maintained good relationship with Valero so that we could um, make a significant contribution to the city without having to go to court, without big messes. You know, and this is why it's important sometimes to be a small committee. So you can be agile, you can be uh, refreshingly clear, you can um, express goodwill and establish the kind of rapport that you need in order to get something done. And I think Valero is also proud of this, so I, I think I speak with authority on that. Um, if I only had this slide, I wish I could turn this around and show you. I'll just tell you the piece. The, the, the 14 million, a good chunk of it in 2008, 
because we had an, uh, maybe I didn't say that, but I should have, that in 2008 we had negotiated an agreement that basically um, brought in the $14 million. We, that was the agreement, or the, uh, the settlement agreement that addressed the addendum. In 2010, we modified that um, agreement because of the city's request that we uh, renegotiate certain terms of the agreement, and we all agreed that that was quite fine. So there have been two settlement agreements, the original in 2008, and then the modified agreement came in 2010. But in the, in, as a whole, we brought in $14 million, of which a good chunk of it, and we can talk about this later, um, a good chunk of it was allocated to projects that we said were important. Tree planting, we'd said that as far back as 2003. So we had $700,000 total for tree planting. Uh, about 500,000 went to the city and about 280,000 went to towards the uh, beginning of a foundation, the Benicia Tree Foundation. So that was significant um, um, and very unusual in our city to say we're going to start a foundation, a private foundation to plant trees on um, non-city property and money for the city to take care of trees and plant new ones and maintain them on city property. Um, there are a host of other things. BUSD benefited. Um, uh, my goodness, if I went through the list. We have a $250,000 um, air monitoring station now. We're fully equipped. We're about to, I hope, finish the website very soon where everybody will have access to the raw data that will be coming forth through that uh, station. Um, uh, Hearthstone, which is our affordable housing units along um, West Military, uh, received solar panels. Um, uh, BUSD's SAGE program was funded. Um, the, I, 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 I don't dare read this whole list, but I have, it's all in the agreements, and I can show you on this, um, this more thorough thing that I've written out has a list of all the things that were funded in 2008 and allocated. In 2010, we uh, provided for a little bit more flexibility for projects that would address energy and water conservation. Now, what you don't know and the most important figure I can give you is that out of all of the money that was allocated, there is $2,613,000 on the table right now that by and large is available to the public. 97% of it is available to the public to come forward with projects that would address water or energy savings in our community. It takes a bit of work because you have to kind of develop an idea, have a proposal, pre pre present it to the Sustainability Commission, which then can recommend um, uh, nay, or say, nay or yay and be helpful to maybe address uh, problems or gaps in your in your proposal, but it can go therefore to city council for approval. The city has ultimate jurisdic jurisdiction over how the money will be spent. But the, the, the good news is that with the Sustainability Commission's formation, part of its job, its main oversight is how do we really use these funds in a way to, um, that will benefit the community most and accomplish what, the, what we set out to do with our climate action plan. I don't know if I've, I've probably gone over my time. Um, so, Constance, you can take over from here, <laughs> or Kathy. Uh, meanwhile, while all the, the negotiation was going on regarding uh, the Good Neighbor Steering Committee and the various agreements and the amended agreements, there's also action going on at the city. Um, in October of 2007, uh, Benicia joined ICLEI, and I always have to look this up because it's not a intuitive uh, initials. ICLEI is the Association of Local Governments regarding climate change. Uh, in 4008, and ICLEI has five steps to go to, to, through to address climate change. In 2008, in April, the, Air Dist uh, the Bay Area Air District awarded Benicia a grant to do an initial inventory of its emissions. Uh, in September of 2008, the uh, council adopted the inventory and set target emission reductions. Um, in October of 2008, and that fall, Benicia partnered with Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to develop a climate action plan, which is, I think, about the third step in the ICLEI milestones. There is a kickoff meeting October 9th, 2008, uh, there is research done by that team uh, from Cal Poly to see what was going on in the city. And then there was extensive public outreach. 
So there's outreach at the farmer's market, there's a planning commission meeting, high school workshop, community workshops, there's an interactive website. Um, the high school workshop was really targeting uh, students. And there is a draft climate action plan done. Uh, that happened in uh, March of 2009 that was released. Uh, it was commented on throughout the summer. And in September 2009, the council approved, excuse me, in yeah, September of 2009, uh, the Benicia City Council adopted the Climate Action Plan, which you all got a copy of. And if you didn't, please feel free to take it. As you can see, it's a substantial document. At the same time that this was happening, there is another group of local activists who were working to have a sustainability commission formed because the last two things that you have to do with the Ickley's milestone is to implement the plan. A plan looks great sitting on a shelf, but unless you make sure that it's implemented, uh, you're not going to do much good. And you also have to monitor uh, to see if your emissions are actually going down. Uh, in addition, uh, we had this big pot of money. So the Sustainability Commission was formed and we went through the process of meeting. There were some few people in this room who came to some of those meetings. We did a council presentation. And in uh, September 2009, excuse me, uh, August 2009, the, the City Council approved the formation of the Sustainability Commission, and we had our first meeting in January 2010. Constance is now going to take over. <laughs> and she's going to tell us a little bit more about what is actually in this climate action plan. So chapters three and four in our story, we've, we've heard about climate change, and the reason that we have to be involved as a community. We've heard Marilyn's incredible story about how a small group of people um, partnered with the city and with Valero in order to uh, achieve significant greenhouse gas reductions as well as funding for climate action. And as Marilyn was talking about the um, uh, 120 strategies, we're going to try to see if we can link community stakeholders and groups to helping us achieve some of those strategies. Um, we were sworn in as a commission on January, in January of 2010. There's Kathy and I completely bewildered as to what do we do now? What have we gotten ourselves into, all of us? Um, it's a brand new commission, 11 members. The city doesn't have a commission of that size. Um, and here, here we all are. Kathy is the chair. I'm vice chair. Ray Lynn, Larry, John Silva, Emmelyn. And we have a current vacancy that's going to be filled. And then the uh, Marilyn, Rosie Switzer, um, Valero's position temporarily filled with uh, Sue Fisher Jones and Randy Scott of Amports, our ex officio uh, members. They uh, have a voice, but they don't vote in the commission. So it's a seven member voting commission, 11 members all together. That's a big commission. And our task wasn't just the Climate Action Plan, but it's a major part of what we have to do. The purpose of the commission is to, uh, I'll tell you my little thought afterwards, to educate, advocate, and provide oversight for integrated solutions that seek a sustainable equilibrium for economic, ecological, and social health and well-being, both now and in the future. I always want to pause and say, amen. Because it is, it's like shampooing the dog. It's a very big uh, <laughs> charter for, for a commission, and you don't finish until you're all the way through the three circles. And the three circles stand for the social aspect, the environmental, and the ecological. Each one of them are, are critical. And if you remember from uh, Dr. Julian's presentation the first time, is that we want to meet that, that balance in the middle where they overlap and we're sustainable. So, and in essence, um, the general plan that the city adopted um, took some very wise words from planners at the United Nation and defined sustainability as meeting today's needs without jeopardizing the ability of the next generation to meet their needs. And it's a, it's a nice, nice concept, is that we should um, use what we need and leave the rest for the future. 
Well, the Climate Action Plan is a major part of what we do, and that fits within that environmental uh, circle. And it's all about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It, the plan itself was approved by City Council in 2009. So imagine 11 new people, new charter. You've got the economy, the environment, and the social well-being now and in the future to worry about, and 120 strategies in the Climate Action Plan. It's a tremendous um, bite of the cake to chew on. Supporting the Climate Action Plan are a lot of laws and policies. And see, now here's the danger that I have a PowerPoint. It's not going to be death by PowerPoint. But there's a lot of uh, information that supports climate action. Um, there's the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol. There's Federal Clean Air Act. There's state mandates. AB 32 is a big one. And we could spend probably a full session on each one of these assembly bills and Senate bills. AB 32 is probably the most forward-thinking and most aggressive uh, climate global warming solution act in the country. And we've already seen um, uh, attempts to actually slow it down. And uh, fortunately, that hasn't happened. We have CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, SB 1771. All this whole grocery list of uh, state acts. And this AB 32 implementation has a, a near-term, mid-term, and long-term implementation. We're already in the near-term phase and mid-term and long-term. As I say, we could spend um, a, a good bit of time just going into what AB 32 is about. But those laws form the basis of why we're doing climate action uh, in Venetia. In 2007, uh, the group that was formed, along with the Cal Poly students, uh, set baseline emission standards for both the year 2000 and 2005. Now, this is something you learn as you start to get involved in this kind of work, is exactly what does a metric ton of CO2 carbon dioxide look like? And here's a... It's 27 feet by 27 feet is a carbon dioxide, a one metric ton of carbon dioxide. Hold that image in your mind. So what they found, that community emissions were, bottom line, 4.25 million tons of carbon dioxide for the city of Benicia per year for 2005. Um, for vehicle miles, 158,000 plus. Electricity, natural gas, 717,000. Um, solid waste, 21,000. And large stationary emitters, i.e. Valero, Amports, our two biggest uh, emitters, over 800,000 tons of carbon dioxide. And it doesn't include, um, doesn't include rail transportation, marine transportation, air transportation. There's a lot of things that have not been included in this baseline. That's community. Um, the city looks good next to us as community. The city government emissions uh, totaled 9,202 carbon dioxide equivalent metric tons. So you can see where the, the main is in. You've got uh, vehicle fleet, 2,000. Employee commute, 800. Electricity, electricity natural gas, 3,000. Solid waste, 2,000. So, um, and we have good news that the city is on its way to meeting its, its goals. So he, here's what their goals are. It's from that 9,202 tons of carbon dioxide um, by 2010, they're supposed to be at 6,901. And by 2020, <coughs> 6,165. Our goals <laughs> are going to be a challenge. We're at, we're at 2005, we're producing 4.25 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. We're to reduce that um, 
to our by 10 percent of what we did in 2000 and that would bring us to 3.6 million tons of carbon dioxide and where do we you know where does the uh, where do the emissions come from? Well, in the city government in 2000, it was 51% from buildings, 28% from solid waste, 21% from transportation. And in the community, can you see? 94% from industrial uh, and commercial. And here we are, residential, 1%, solid waste, a little better than 1%, and 4% transportation. In 2005, we've had some reduction. The commercial um, industrial are 75%. OK, in order to succeed, we have to collect data, and we have to implement our strategies. And there's a lot of data that we need to collect. And right now, we're, we're collecting data. We're not inputting it, and we're not analyzing it yet. And uh, a bit of that is due just because there's limitations in city staffing. We're under a budget crisis right now. But we get water bills from um, the city. Uh, Allied Waste provides incredible, if you're, whoever thought you'd have interest in solid waste. But they provide a lot of very interesting, very high level uh, information about the kind of trash they no longer call it trash, they call it resource, right? Resource al reallocation from the, from the community. And in July, we'll actually um, mention this as part of our strategies, but in July, they are starting a new franchise agreement that's going to increase um, our ability to recycle. And then there's PG&E data, which is quite complicated and complex to, to look at. Uh, Larry Lamoureux and I have spent hours just looking at uh, water data. Um, the areas of focus for emission reduction, there are eight areas. Um, public education and outreach has a lot of um, uh, things to do, but in terms of emission reduction, uh, we're zero. We're very neutral, unfortunately. It's the other areas in solar energy, wind energy, transportation, etc., that have a bigger impact. And here's how the 120 strategies break down. 15 relate to education public outreach, 14 for energy production, 11 for industrial and commercial, 27 for transportation and land use, 18 for buildings, 11 for water and wastewater, 8 for solid waste, and 16 for parks and open spaces. And you can kind of see the areas that uh, each relate to. And here's where I'd like you to be thinking as you as we think together, is where are your interests that you might have, uh, you're already working either uh, within the community, with, uh, with your groups, or other stakeholders, or in your own businesses, where are some alliances that we might make, some partnerships? Here's how they break down, and I can show you that um, we actually have some strategies that have been completed. Um, particularly, in, and high marks go to our, our building uh, department, because in the area of building, they've actually uh, implemented some, some of these. And th the bottom there indicates, if you can see it in the tiny type, uh, the actual number that, that are in progress or are completed. If we arrange the strategies, the focus areas, with the largest greenhouse gas reduction, the order would be with energy at the top, transportation second, um, industry and commercial third, buildings fourth, parks and rec fifth, water and wastewater sixth, and then uh, solid waste is seventh in terms of their impact. And if we looked at it this way, what strategies would actually, if we could implement them, would start to reduce greenhouse gas emissions the most? You can see it's under energy, industrial, commercial, transportation, then buildings, then um, uh, water, wastewater, and solid waste. So part of our st struggle and, and try to grapple with some of these issues is to really find out within the 120 strategies, where are the ones that really uh, give us the most impact in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. Now, 
there, all these strategies are detailed. And I'm, not, I'm just going to show you two pages. Here's the one for education, and here's the one for energy. But all this is laid out. If anyone has any interest in it, uh, we can provide you with the Excel spreadsheets. But it will actually show you in that uh, emissions reduction column, E, how much impact, if we did that strategy, that that effect would have in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a lot of detail there. Here's what we're working on in 2011. The yellow, one through four, are, are areas we've already taken action on. And um, um, so we are working to update and maintain our website, educational workshops, here we are. Uh, change a light program, you'll hear more about that. Incentives for residential plumbing and fixture upgrades. And then some of the other areas, which are trying to get the city to limit uh, its spending on bottled water. And uh, a building audit and energy program. Green business certification program. Michael Perrick, I look at him because we have some alliances there. Uh, redu reduced mowing frequency in parks, facility, cash for grass. When we first mentioned at a sustainability commission meeting, people laughed and said, is that a Berkeley program or what? And I said, no, no, grass grass. OK. Um, I want to quickly wrap up with this so we can get into some discussion. But one of the things that we also have learned as a new commission is that there's a coordination, comment, and approval process. As Marilyn rightly said, the commission makes recommendation, and it's up to the city council to actually approve. Um, some of our major commissions that we coordinate with are the Historic Preservation Review Committee and the Planning Commission and others. And I show you just, again, for an example, um, if we were dealing with something residential, non-historic, in the area of energy strategies, things like the uh, Renewable Energy Fund, E2.4, it's a, a, a voluntary program, and we would want to move from the Sustainability Commission to City Council. Now, those of you who uh, haven't been following the Benicia Herald um, may not know that we've had some little snags with bicycle racks. <laughs> and um, we now know that we want to make sure that we touch base with all the stakeholders within the community. And we're much more uh, alert and aware of that kind of process. Where do we stand so far uh, with some of these strategies? Because of the Valero Good Neighbor Steering Committee Settlement Agreement, there are demonstrated demonstration electric vehicles at City Hall. And if you go around, you can see them parked and plugged in. Um, the air monitoring Marilyn has talked about, that's virtually ready to come online. And we'll be able, as citizens, to be able to see where, what's happening. The website's in progress. If anyone has heard about caterpillar puppets for K3 in Benicia, talking about and educating children about being water wise. The SAGE, Emlyn SAGE is? Right. So funding has gone to SAGE and the new Echo 2 Green Academy at Benicia High School, again to the Valero Good Neighbors Steering Committee Settlement. Mm -hmm. Stewards of our children's future, We've, it's in progress. It's our education and public outreach. And um, Oh, yeah. There's Betsy Julian in this very room, which is online. And we're very excited to say that we're going to be bringing Dominican universities. Um, they're doing an extract or a synthesis of the Green MBA program that's going to be starting in the fall. And that's going to be a six in-depth lecture series. You're going to get a letter of completion from doing that. We're, um, Dominican University has a Green MBA program that's highly regarded. And so uh, we're going to do that, and we're going to go more deeply into the areas found within the Climate Action Plan as the third series. We have Chevron Energy Solutions, a whole project bringing uh, solar array panels into the city that's covering quite a few of our strategy, one of them being Renewable Energy Manager, Renewable Energy for City Facilities, and City Parking Lot Solar Arrays. Um, solar permitting fee is uh, waived in Benicia. And under buildings, you can see what a good job that they've done. Uh, some are completed and some are in progress. 
home audits has been a tremendous success with innovations. There's still uh, some audits ready to have. And on their website, if you go to innovations.com and uh, look for Benicia under groups, you can see that from their research, which is every home that does an audit, they look at your um, water and electricity billing for the year prior and then the year after the audit. And it has shown that we ha that these audits have saved over 48,000 pounds of CO2. So it's actually having a, a very positive effect in the city. Um, transportation land use, we've got new ve fleet vehicle criteria. It's in progress. Efficiency and street lighting, that we're going to have LED street lighting. Has that happened yet? They're being installed. And um, oh, here we go, that bicycle infrastructure. Um, that's happening through our hoops of fire and bicycle <laughs> hoops. OK, industrial and commercial. Uh, LEED certification for new buildings larger than 6,000 square feet and a green building consulting and technical assistance. It's in progress. And here's some more that are already on this thing. Parks and open spaces, they've got one that's done. And Larry, there you are. But not in living color, I'm sorry. The only in black and white. And planting um, the first, looks like, I don't know, what does that look like? A tomato, is it? Squash. It's a squash, OK. In the commun new community garden, which is in underutilized space, right down on First Street. So sustainability is more than the Climate Action Plan. But the Climate Action Plan is a major part of what we do. It, but it is about economic, ecological, and social health and well-being. We feel that with the funding that we have available, that it not only will it help in greenhouse gas reduction, but it is an economic stimulus to our community. If we can get that money uh, into projects that are going to employ people, reduce our expenditures, and reduce greenhouse gas. So we're looking for, in our next phase, I'm ready to call on Sharon Maher, is to really move into the workshop portion of this. And we're looking for opportunities to work together. So um, in our area of education public outreach, it's everything from these lectures and workshops, the green job training, uh, linking information from various groups throughout the community on our website, science fairs, Earth Day. We've just had Climate Action Day is coming up. We want to have anybody who's interested in marching with us, should we get permission, uh, down First Street. All the people who are working towards sustainability with green t-shirts and green umbrellas. So um, the, 3rd July parade. the 3rd of July the 3rd parade. July. That's the 4th of July parade that's held on the 3rd of July. Art exhibits, awards, and gardens. And in fact, uh, we want to partner very closely with our Arts and Culture Commission because who better than our artists and poets in the community can help express where we are. So I started with this to indicate the areas of opportunity to work on. Um, Sharon, are we ready to move into workshop? All right. Sharon Maher has been helping us every uh, lecture series. Those of you who have been here before are familiar with what, what we do next. And I'll let Sharon come up and talk about that part. So um, as Constance said, for those of you who haven't met, good evening. My name is Sharon. I'm a citizen of Benicia, just like all of you. I am not part of the commission, but I have been asked to help uh, with the remainder of the evening tonight for us to get together and take the information that we just got and use the brain power that's in this room to come up with some good ideas for the commission. So you all have been, I noticed, very attentive listening as I had to all this information we got. Now it's our turn. So we're going to, uh, how many of you have, uh, it, this is the first night that you've been to any of the sustainability meetings? So maybe about a third to half. And the others have been to one or the other of the meetings. OK, so some of you know what we're going to do. We, we revise it each time. But we're going to do something called a cafe. A world cafe is what it's known as. But we're calling it the Benicia Cafe. So I'm going to ask you to get together in small groups. We have some tables. We're going to move into the room. And I'm going to ask you to kind of get cozy with people around these tables. We have 45 people, roughly, in the room tonight. And um, so 
we have four tables, so we're going to mix and match us around those tables. We're going to give you some color pens. We're going to ask you to talk with each other around a topic that we give you and write on your pe paper on the table your thoughts around those things. We're going to do that pretty quickly because, first of all, we have a hard stop to be out of this room closed and delivered back to the library by 9 p.m. Excuse me. <coughs> by 9 p.m. So that means we actually have to do cleanup. So for the next half hour or so, we're going to all work together and then we're going to sit down for the last few minutes and talk about what we came up with that would be useful for the commission. One of the things I learned tonight, well I learned a lot of things tonight, there's a lot of information there, is that this commission has been around for a long time, longer than I realized, in terms of its heart and spirit before it was formal. And that uh, um, it's a fabulous enabler for our community uh, with our input to be able to make recommendations around how to use this money that we're so lucky to have. So um, this is our chance to give the commission our thoughts about how we can best do that. Another thing I thought about is the number of people in the room. So if I'm right, Benicia has about 25,000, 27. So let's say 25 for the purpose of round numbers, of which 1% of that would be what? 250. And in this room is 45. So we are about 20% of 1% of the community. So if you think about that, and if each one of us went out tomorrow and talked to five people we knew in town about what we did today, we would hit 250 people. 1% of Benicia. I mean, think about that. If we just do that a few times, that 1% grows and grows and grows. So we have such a great opportunity here to make such a difference and to spread the word of what the commission is doing and what we can bring to the commission. So I just had to throw that out there because I thought, you know, that's, that's just how, that's like shampooing the dog. <laughs> We're just going to get started on it <laughs> and keep going. All right, so what I'd like you to do, everyone, is please stand up, and we're going to bring tables around. I'm going to ask you to get in groups of six. Uh.